The stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Let us go to our God in silent prayer. Beloved congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, our help is in the name of Jehovah who made heaven and earth. Grace, mercy, and peace be granted unto you from God our Father, and Jesus Christ the Lord, to the operation of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Let's sing 368. 368 from Psalm 132, the house of God. Let's sing the five stanzas. <coughs>
Let's give ear to the law of God as that is found in Exodus chapter 20. God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Our Lord Jesus Christ gives us the summary of the law. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength. This is the first and the great commandment, and the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets. Let's turn to Psalter number 109. 109. Let's sing the four stanzas.
Let's call upon God's holy name. Our Father in heaven, thou triune God, the family God in thyself, and the God who has revealed thyself unto thy people in Jesus Christ, and made and established with them an eternal covenant of grace and has shown thyself to us in the face of Jesus Christ so that we of all people might call on thee as our Father. And what a glorious Father thou art. We cast, Lord, all our cares upon thee knowing that Thou dost care for us. Who are we, Lord? Who are our children but sinners? Sinners saved by grace, so that we must ever stand in Thy presence and must ever humble ourselves before Thee we must ever cry out, O oh God, be merciful to me, the sinner. And we can say with the apostle, Jesus Christ came to save sinners, of whom I am chief. And we rejoice <coughs> with the publicans and sinners. Christ's own day, who heard him say, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So, Lord, always show us our sin. We enter thy courts on this new day, the beginning of the week. And against us, sin has battled hard. We're troubled by sin. We're troubled by our own sin, and that we must live in a world of sin. For our Lord was crucified. And where he is crucified daily. And... We hate that sin. It fills us with loathing and with disgust. And Lord, we thank Thee that we can see our sin. That we're not as the world who, knowing the judgment of God, either accuse or excuse one another 
for all their sin and who revel in it, who run in it, and whose response over against thy judgment is either a sham repentance or it is a gnashing of their teeth. <coughs> Lord, ever give us soft hearts and ever correct us as our good Father so that we are disciplined by thy word, by thy spirit, by the events of our life, may we not be blind to thy speech. May we not be insensitive to thy hand when thou dost speak against us and when thy hand is heavy on us Cause, O oh Lord, that we might understand what Thou art saying to us, and that we might turn daily from our sin, that we might turn daily unto Thee, that we might, <coughs> over against all of our sin and weakness, too, Find all our hope and all our joy and all our confidence in the cross of Jesus Christ. We glory in that cross, O Lord, by whom we are crucified to the world and the world to us. For at that cross, we are dead and buried with Christ in order to be raised to newness of life and being dead with him, we are also dead to the law. That bad marriage that we had. Whereas children of Adam, that law was an oppressive and accusatory husband. He pointed out all of our sin, and who constantly pointed out that we are worthy of condemnation, and who was right, who was right about us because of our fallen Adam, and being dead with Christ. We are dead to the law, so that it can no more bind upon us our guilt. It can no longer curse us with its threats. And being dead to the law, we're married to another, even to the Lord Jesus Christ, who's a good husband covered us with his blood, who washes us with the word, and who continually makes intercession for us before thy face. And so, Lord, also we ask all things in his name, knowing that in him we have a vivid and brilliant demonstration thy love of us. And so, Lord, <coughs> bestow a blessing upon this church. Be present here by thy word and spirit. Defend us, O God, and our children from the evil. For we know that the devil and his seed hates the church. 
that the devil and his seed is at war with the church, and that they know who we are, and they seek to oppress us and to rob us of our joy, to turn us to the way of sin, to pollute us with all of their defilement, the defilement of their mind and of their heart, to lead us captive and to hurt us. O Lord, in the earth there are dark abodes of crime and cruelty. And Lord, thou hast freed us <coughs> from such a cesspool where we and our children were a prey. And so create by thy powerful word and spirit a hedge about us and our children that the evil might not come nigh unto us and that the evil cannot hurt us or destroy us that the world can never take away our joy, a joy in thee, a joy in our salvation, a joy in the hope of eternal life. Be, Father, with our families, that our homes may be places of order, that they may be places of a true and genuine love, one for another, a deep care and concern for each other and for our eternal salvation, that parents may instruct their children <coughs> and discipline them in the fear of the Lord, that Brothers and sisters may be holy one with another and may esteem one another. Father, be with our marriages which lie at the foundation of those homes. That as husbands we might love our wives as our own selves and give, us, give ourselves to them even as Christ gave himself to the church. And as wives, that we may submit ourselves unto our own husbands and love for them and thanksgiving for them. We pray, Father, for our elders, the deacons. Thou hast given them much work. Hold them in that work, bless them in that work, give them wisdom and courage in that work. Give them always thy word, which is thy power unto salvation, the savor of life unto life, and the savor of death unto death. And now, Father, be with us, as we continue in our worship, we thank thee for gathering us here. Give us a peaceful hour. Put away all mundane and worldly thoughts from our minds. Draw us unto thyself. Give us ears to hear and hearts to understand what the Spirit saith to the churches. And therefore also, be with the minister. Give him the unction of the Spirit that he might speak thy word. And give it sense and meaning that that word may go forth and that, that word may be received as it is in truth the very word of God. Hear us, Father of mercy, for we ask these things not because we are worthy, but for Jesus' sake. Amen. The offerings are for the general fund and for benevolence. We worship the Lord with our offerings.
243. 243. Let's sing stanzas 1256 and 15. 1256 and 15. We read the word of God from John chapter 16. These things have I spoken unto you that ye should not be offended. 
they shall put you out of the synagogues, yea, the time cometh, that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. And these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things have I told you, that when the time shall come, ye may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning, because I was with you. But now I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you asketh me, Whither goest thou? But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and ye see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I, that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. Then said some of his disciples among themselves, What is this that he saith unto us? A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again a little while, and ye shall see me. And because I go to the Father. They said therefore, What is this that he saith? <coughs> a little while, we cannot tell what he saith. Now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him, and said unto them, Do ye inquire among yourselves of that I said, A little while, and ye shall not see me, and again a little while, and ye shall see me? Verily, verily, I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. And ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow, because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish, for joy that a man is born into the world. And ye now therefore have sorrow. But I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice and your joy no man taketh from you. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs. But the time cometh, and I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. At that day you shall ask in my name, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me, and have believed that I came out from God. I came forth from the Father, and am come into the world. Again I leave the world, and go to the Father." His disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly, and speakest no proverb. Now we are sure that thou knowest all things, and needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. Jesus answered them, Do ye now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, 
that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Thus far the reading of the Holy and Divine Scripture is on the basis of that passage and many others that we have the teaching of the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 46, Lord's Day 46. <clears throat> Why hath Christ commanded us to address God thus, our Father, that immediately in the very beginning of our prayer, he might excite in us a childlike reverence for and confidence in God, which are the foundation of our prayer, namely, that God has become our Father in Christ and will much less deny us what we ask of him in true faith <coughs> than our parents will refuse us earthly things. Why is it here added which art in heaven? Lest we should form any earthly conception of God's heavenly majesty and that we may expect from his almighty power all things necessary for soul and body. Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, you must remember the origin of the Lord's instruction in the, in the Lord's prayer. The origin of that instruction was a request from the apostles that the Lord would teach them to pray as John taught his disciples to pray. That was a deeply humble request from deeply spiritual men. They didn't want from the Lord the power to work miracles. They didn't want from the Lord power and glory. They wanted from the Lord instruction on how to pray. And that's because they understood the importance of prayer. Prayer we might call the breath of God's covenant. In the covenant... There is fellowship between the triune God and his people that stands behind Jesus' declaration that the Father loveth you and that the Father loveth you because you love me and believe that I am come from the Father. There you have fellowship, love in the covenant of grace. That's what the covenant is all about. The covenant is about a loving relationship a loving relationship in which two people esteem each other as precious and dear, and they seek the good, the eternal good, but also the earthly good of the one that they love. <clears throat> and in that relationship of the covenant, there is fellowship between God and his people. And that fellowship, of course, on our part, every day could be called prayer. Every day you live before the face of God. Every day you live in conscious dependence upon God for your breath and for your heartbeats and for all that you need, body and soul, so that the apostle can say to you, pray without ceasing. That doesn't mean you always have your eyes closed and your hands folded. That's talking about our very life in God's covenant. It is a life of prayer because it is a life lived in the presence of God. There's an old Latin phrase in Coram Deo, in the very presence of God. That's what the covenant is. That's what the apostle says in Romans 5 that God gave to us in Jesus Christ. He gave to us an introduction into the very presence of God and into this grace wherein we stand. That's a life of prayer. Standing consciously in the grace of God. Trusting consciously to that grace of God for eternal life. That's a life of prayer. And if that 
is a description of our life, we have to say, too, we don't do that very often. It's a good thing that we have a mediator and a Savior who stands in the presence of God every day and who prays to God every day. And it was <laughs> in the conscious knowledge of their own lack in prayer that the apostles said to Christ, teach us to pray. We know that prayer is important, and we know our own lack. Teach us to pray. And that's always really the request of the child of God. It isn't that we don't know how to pray. It isn't that we don't pray. But we want to grow in prayer. We want to understand that prayer more and more. The glory of that prayer. The power of that prayer. The beauty of that prayer. The truth of that prayer. And so the apostles too asked Jesus Christ, Lord, teach us to pray. And two, that request came in the context of their own awareness of a monumental change that had happened in the coming of Jesus Christ. It isn't that the saints in the Old Testament did not pray. It isn't though the disciples did not pray. They did pray. Quite Christ implies that they were praying men. He says hither too, you didn't ask anything in my name. He's talking about the form of their prayer. And he says, after I go away, you are going to ask in my name. And when he taught them, therefore, to pray, he also gave to them what must have been a shocking opening statement. When you pray, he said, say, Our Father, which art in heaven. That was a revolutionary thing. That was a shocking thing. And it's that lovely address. It isn't that they didn't know God as their Father. It isn't that that truth of the fatherhood of God was completely unknown and hidden in the Old Testament. That isn't true. But with the coming of Jesus Christ, with the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the truth that God is our Father is revealed in all its fullness and its glory. And the Catechism comes right to the heart of it, as the Catechism always does. This is the foundation of all our prayer. And you could really say, this is the foundation of all our life. If all of our life is lived up out of that prayer, if all of our life is lived out of the engine of that prayer, then this is the engine of our life. This is the dynamo of our life. This is the power of our life. The truth that God has become our Father. I say to you, if you believe that, the world can never take your joy. If you believe that, you'll have peace. In every circumstance of life, no matter how terrible it is, though they deliver you up, as Christ said, to the councils and to the synods and to the synagogues and to the, the government, and though killing you, they think they do God's service. Though you're rejected of family and friends, though you endure suffering and trial and tribulation in the world, this is the foundation of our prayer, and this is then also the foundation of all our life. There is an unspeakable peace in those words. There is an unspeakable joy in those words. There's a fullness of joy there. God is become our Father in Jesus Christ. And that's why Jesus taught us, when you pray, pray our Father. And it's that, the loveliness of that, that Christ is also explaining at the end of John. And so we consider uh, this Lord's Day briefly uh, under that theme, uh, prayer to our Father. Notice 
uh, our Father in Christ. Uh, Notice our Father who cares for us. And notice our Father in heaven. When Jesus Christ uh, taught his disciples and therefore taught us to pray to our Father which art in heaven, then Jesus Christ was teaching that he is the revelation of God the Father, God triune, and that in him we are become the children of the living God. And when Christ taught that we are become the children of God, and Christ taught that he reveals God the Father to us, you must understand that he is revealing, first of all, what God is in himself. God is absolutely independent. And the independency of God means that God does not depend on man. God does not depend ever on the creature for anything that God himself is. What God shows to us that he is in relationship to us. And here when God shows to us that he is in relationship to us a father, then God is saying that is what I am independently of you in myself. God is in himself. God is within his one being as the one God. God is a father. And you have to understand that according to the truth of the Trinity. When God says that he is a father, he implies first of all that he has a son eternally. And when God says that he is a father then he also implies that there is love between the Father and the Son. You have to understand God's fatherhood. According to the truth of the Trinity, God is in himself, from eternity to eternity, a Father. The first person is called the Father because that first person, from eternity and to eternity, as the activity, the eternal activity of that one person, from eternity to eternity, at all times, he is begetting his son. That's an eternally ongoing activity. That's not once and done. Eternally, the father is begetting his son. And eternally, that son then is being begotten of the father. And then also because it is God who begets his son and the son who is begotten of his father, eternally there is a relationship of love. And that love you can simply call the spirit. The spirit is the personal bond of affection and love. The spirit is the personal delight of the father in his son. Just as two lovers who come very close, they breathe on one another, they kiss one another, they embrace one another. That is the Spirit. And that is God. God is a family God in himself. That's why there is in our church, and that's why there is among his people, families. Because from eternity, God is in himself a family. He is father and son who uh, delight in one another, love one another. So that God isn't dependent on us to be a father. God didn't need us to be a father. God didn't need us to have a family. God had his family. But rather, it was God's purpose, eternal purpose, in love for a people, a people in whom he delighted. In love for them, he willed that they be taken into his family, that they know him as their father, that they call upon him as father, that they depend upon him for everything for body and soul that they taste by experience 
the delight of being in the family of God. God willed that. So that God is a father in himself, and God willed to have for himself a family. And God's fatherhood then, outside of himself, God's fatherhood inside himself is the Trinity. God's fatherhood outside of himself begins with Jesus Christ. That's what we sang about in Psalm 89. That really was the revelation of God's fatherhood in the Old Testament. I said it wasn't as though they didn't know about God's fatherhood in the Old Testament. But that relationship was revealed especially in King David. That relationship was revealed corporately in the nation of Israel. And so we sang in Psalm 89, David and David's son will cry out, Thou art my God, my Father. And that's pointing to the fact of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The Son of God in whom God delights, the Son of God whom God loves, the Son for whom and by whom God made all things. The Son in whom God will perfect all things so that He's going to unite heaven and earth. He will raise that heaven and earth up into eternal glory. He's going to join all things to this man. That's Jesus Christ. He is the Son of God. So that when Jesus taught us to pray our Father, He meant Himself in the hour. The man Jesus Christ has the triune God as his Father. That's what Jesus meant when Jesus throughout his ministry prayed to his Father, when he called upon his Father. That man, for Jesus Christ as to his person, is the second person of the Trinity. And that second person of the Trinity became a man. And that man has the triune God as his Father. And in that man, God as Father of his people is revealed. And in that man, we become the children of the living God. And that become, in the catechism, a very important word, that become points out the graciousness of that relationship. Become means that you weren't. Become means that your status has changed. Become means that before you were a son, you were something else. And you have to look at that according to our own human nature. By nature, as children of Adam, we are not the sons and daughters of the living God. By nature, as we are in Adam, we are the children of the devil. <coughs> That's what Adam, as a father, brought upon all his children. Adam in the beginning was a bad father. Adam in the beginning lived selfishly in his home. Adam in the beginning sought his own glory as a father. And he wrecked his home. He ruined all his children. And that includes us, all men by nature. All men as they are born in Adam. All men as they come into the world aren't the children of God. There is no universal fatherhood of God, an umbrella that embraces all men, all men that ever have been, and all men that ever are, and all men that ever will. There's no fatherhood of God with relationship to the whole human race. The whole human race became children of the devil and Adam. And that's how we are born too. We become God's children. We become God's children by a wonder of grace. And that becoming, you have to understand, begins in eternity. That becoming begins with God's eternal appointment. He appointed us to be the sons and daughters of the living God.
That's what the Apostle says in Romans chapter 8. Whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. God, in choosing Jesus Christ, God did not want Jesus Christ to be an only child. So God appointed Jesus Christ firstborn, and he appointed us into his family to become his children in Jesus Christ. And it's according to that eternal decree that we also become God's children in our own nature, in our own consciousness, in our own minds, through the wonder of regeneration. That's what regeneration is. Regeneration is taking out that old stony heart that hates God as a child of the devil and putting in the soft heart of flesh that loves the Lord your God. That regeneration creates sons of God. You have that regeneration in an old nature. That's true. But John, who wrote here, John also says in 1 John, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. That's a real change. Now are we the sons of God. That's, that's the two kinds of people that exist in the world. Sons of God and sons of the devil. God spoke about that from the very beginning. There will be a seed of the serpent and there will be a seed of the woman. And that happens in the world according to God's eternal predestination, according to his election and according to his reprobation. According to his election, we become the sons of God. Doesn't yet appear what we shall be. The glory of that has not yet fully been revealed. But we know that when he appears, we'll be like him. All of the glory of Jesus Christ as the Son of God will radiate to us. We'll be transformed as the sons of God through the light of the knowledge of God seen in the face of Jesus Christ from glory to glory. We are the sons of God. And I say, uh, that's what Jesus Christ was impressing upon his disciples. The glory of that statement, we are become the sons of God. We are that by the wonder of grace. We are that by the wonder of adoption. We aren't that by nature. God must adopt us. And that adoption is that God legally takes us into his family. We were born into another family. A cruel family, a wicked family, a destructive family in which we all would have perished. God, through the forgiveness of sins, adopts us as his, his dear children. You don't deserve to be his children. By nature and according to your own deeds, you're unworthy of being his children, but he adopts you. And he says, these are my children. And then according to that, that appointment and according to that adoption, then he also makes us his children. That's why there is in the child of God the very desire to pray. Oh, the ungodly don't have that desire. You and God, they don't want to pray. They won't. They can't, but they won't. They don't want to sing. They don't want to read the Bible. The child of God is very different. He loves to be in the presence of God. He loves to pray. He loves to sing. And it was out of that fact that the apostles also said to Christ, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray better. Teach us to understand the glory of our position now as the sons of God. Teach us to call on God. And Jesus says, well, what you need to understand first, what must be the very foundation of your prayer, is that God is become your Father. 
And it's, it's the wonder of that, it's the glory of that Christ is describing in John chapter 16 in remarkable language. Uh, he says there, In that day ye shall ask me nothing. And you say, what? Aren't they going to pray to Jesus Christ? And he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. And later on he says, Hitherto ye have asked nothing in my name. Did that mean there that they weren't praying people? Or that they didn't understand that they had to go to God through Jesus Christ? No, Christ is pointing out the wonderful change that happens through his cross and resurrection in the relationship between God's people and the triune God. And if I may explain that to you this way, asking in Jesus' name, when Jesus said, you didn't ask anything in my name, to this point, you have never asked anything in my name. And Jesus said to them, you're not going to ask me anything. What he meant there is, when they prayed before, they did pray in the full knowledge of what Christ's cross and resurrection was going to accomplish. That explained all of their weird reaction. They were sorrowful and weepy. And Christ says, well, let me explain to you why you're sorrowful and weepy. Because the transition from the Old Testament to the New Testament, the transition from your understanding now of your relationship to God to your understanding after I die of your relationship to God is like a woman going through childbirth. You're going to sorrow. You're going to sorrow because a baby's being born. But when that baby's born, you're going to have joy. And he says, that's why you have sorrow right now. You don't understand what's happening. But afterward, you will have joy, and your joy will be full. I return to the Father that you might have peace. And your joy is such a joy that the world can never take that away from you. And that's what Christ is explaining when Christ says, you're going to ask in my name. And then he says, I'm not going to ask anything for you. I tell you not, I will not ask for you. But you will ask the Father, and the Father will give it you for my sake. And that's what asking in Jesus' name means. Asking in Jesus' name does not mean that you don't go to Christ. It doesn't mean that you don't come to God through Christ, but asking in Jesus' name means asking in the confidence of the perfection of the person and natures and work of Jesus Christ. Asking in Jesus' name means that you ask believing that God has become your Father. And that's what Jesus explains too. The Father loveth you. I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. Does that mean that he doesn't make intercession for us? No, he's constantly before the face of God making intercession for us. What that means is his office of intercessor is that he's not begging and pleading God to be kind to us. He's not begging and pleading for God to love us, for God already loved us. And the manifestation of that love was Christ himself. And that's what the apostles would understand after the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the light that would turn on. That's why they would have joy. They would understand all of a sudden, God, God has become our Father. That's why Christ came into the world. That's why Christ was crucified. That's why Christ rose again. That's why Christ had to go away. That's why Christ said he will come again and comfort us. God has become our Father. And when you ask in Jesus' name, that's the confidence in which you're asking. Jesus Christ, by his cross and resurrection, has made me a child of the living God. 
And the Catechism says that's the foundation of your prayer. Now let me explain that to you. That means that you believe too then that God will care for you. That God has become your Father means that God will care for you. That's a simple concept, but we don't believe that very often. That's a simple concept. God is our Father, and God will care for us. But how many times don't we doubt that in our own life? Will God help us in this situation? How is that situation going to turn out? How are we going to get through that situation? But believing that God has become your Father means that you also believe God will care for you. He will provide you with everything that you need for body and soul. And that's what the catechism means when the catechism says he'll give you whatsoever you ask in true faith. And that's what Christ means when he says, whatever you ask in my name, God will give you. God will care for us. Isn't that what a father is? What is a father? That's a good question to ask. What is a father? And when you ask that question and answer it, don't look at yourself and say, well, I do this and I do this and I do this. That's what a father is. And then you make God in your image and you say, well, God is like me. I do this for my children and I love my children this way. And so God must be that way too. No, no. If you ask what a father is, you have to look at God first. What is a father? A father in love begets a child. Consciously. He he brings that child into the world. In love. And that love, then of that child shows itself in his seeking of that child's eternal welfare. First of all, that's God. God begot us in love. God begot us in love, a love that was from the foundation of the world, before the foundation of the world. And God who begot us in love then is determined upon our eternal welfare. And God, therefore, does all things in our life with a view to that eternal welfare. And in that love, therefore, and the seeking of our eternal welfare, God provides for us all things necessary for body and soul. That's a father. That's a father. A father seeks, first of all, the eternal welfare of his children. He doesn't, first of all, he seeks their welfare. He doesn't seek himself. He doesn't seek his own glory. He doesn't seek his own pleasure. He seeks their welfare. All that he is and all that he has, he seeks their welfare. And that welfare that he seeks is, first of all, an eternal one. And isn't that he simply provides for them a a stellar college education, and he provides for them all kinds of of good things in the home. He gives them toys, and he gives them plenty of food, and and they're well-dressed. And It isn't that merely that he gives them all kinds of good things. He seeks their eternal welfare. All things that he does in in, in his caring for them is eternal is subservient to that point. And that means, too, that that father instructs. He teaches his children the truth. He takes a lively interest in that upbringing. And that means that that father disciplines. That discipline is the seeking of the eternal welfare of the children. If that discipline is anything else than that, it's abuse. That discipline may be severe. In some cases, that discipline must be severe. 
if a child mocks the one who's disciplining them. If a child ridicules the teacher or ridicules the parent, when that teacher or parent is disciplining that child, that's wicked. That may never be tolerated in the covenant. And then the discipline becomes severe. When that child shows defiance over against the parent, that discipline becomes severe. When that child behaves in a wicked and ungodly way, the discipline becomes severe. But that discipline is always motivated by the, by the love of that parent for that child. Because that parent knows, apart from that discipline, you ruin the child. You ruin them for the rest of their life. Without that discipline, you do what Eli did. Eli's sons lived like ungodly men in the church. They were predators, and they lived like predators right in the church at the door of the tabernacle. And what did Eli say? All Eli could bring himself to do was to give a mild rebuke. Boys, boys, you shouldn't do that. And Eli should have severely disciplined those boys. He should have thrown them out of the church, deposed them from their office, done everything in his power. Those boys could no longer live as predators in the church. That's love. It's hatred of the child. If that child lives sinfully, if that child mocks the teacher or mocks the parent, if that child defies the teacher and defies the parent, if that child lives wickedly in the home or in the school, it's hatred of that child to allow that to go on. It's hatred. You aren't seeking his eternal welfare. You're letting him perish in his own sin. And he will perish. A father loves his children. He loves his children dear. For their welfare, Sometimes he applies the rod. Not because he's angry. Not because they inconvenienced him. Not because he's going to show them who's boss. You never discipline God's children that way, show you who's boss. That's how you deal with reprobates. That's the only language the reprobate understands. Sheer power. That's why God says he deals with reprobates with a rod of iron. And I will break them in pieces like a rod of iron. That's not God's children. God's children at a very early age show themselves to have the Spirit. And they show themselves to have the Spirit when they respond to the rebukes, to the rods, to the discipline of their parents. That's a father. That's our father. And that father then, in seeking the eternal welfare of those children, the Father, too, provides for their food and their drink. He makes sure they're washed and cleaned, they have a place to sleep at night. The home is safe. They have a Christian education. They go to church. 
And that's our Father. We're very often bad fathers. And it's by the grace of God that our children really ever turn out. That's his gift to us. Do you know how utterly dependent you are in the upbringing of your children on God and his grace? That he has become a father to you and to your children after you? You're utterly dependent on him as a father. And he cares for us. Striking language, the catechism. He will much less deny us what we ask of him in true faith than our parents will refuse us earthly things. Sometimes you refuse your children earthly things when they're asking for a new bike when they have a bike or they're asking for steak when they can get by on what mother made for dinner. You refuse them earthly things. But when they ask you with an empty belly, can I have something to eat? When they ask you with a dry mouth, can I have something to drink? Would you ever refuse them? If they asked you for a piece of bread, would you give them a scorpion? If they asked you for a piece of fish, would you give them a, a rock? We don't like to refuse our children earthly things. We give them what we think is good for them. We give them their food and their drink, and we delight to do it because we love them. Now, much less God. Christ just simply says, whatever you ask in my name, he'll give you. Do you think that way very often? I don't. Sometimes you think that you have to argue God into giving you what you ask. You have to explain to him why, why this thing is good. And, that's, and Christ just simply says, if you, whatever you ask in my name, that will I give you. Catechism says, whatever you ask in true faith, he'll give you. And that qualifies what you ask for. The Catechism says what you need for body and soul. We don't go to God asking for all, all kinds of, of extras. We ask God for what we need. Really, that's asking in true faith. That's what true faith does. True faith simply throws all its cares upon God. True faith simply says, I have nothing. God has everything. And I need God to supply me everything necessary for my body and soul. And much less will God refuse you than you would refuse your parents. And he's given to you a picture of that. He's given to you a solid demonstration of that. And that picture and solid demonstration is Jesus Christ. You know how willing God is to give you all things? He gave you Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was the love of God's life. Jesus Christ was in the bosom of the Father from all eternity. God delighted in Jesus Christ. God loved Jesus Christ. God spared not His own Son for your sake. That's how willing God is. God would not allow you to perish in your sins. God did not want you to live in your guilt. God didn't want you to continue on in those sins. And so God gave Jesus Christ and God poured out on Jesus Christ all his wrath that he might show you mercy and you grace. That's how willing he is to give you all things. Really, you could say he already did. He already gave you all things. When he gave you Jesus Christ, and he gives those all things to you. We can't see that because we don't look with the eye of faith very often. When he gives you cancer, he's giving you all things. 
Because his goal is beyond this life. When he gives you trouble in your life, he's giving you all things. Because all those things serve your eternal salvation. He gives to us. He doesn't refuse us. He always hears our cries. And to prove that, you only need to look at Jesus Christ, our Father who cares for us. And our Father then who's not only willing, but able. That's what Christ was teaching when Christ added in, our, in heaven. That you might not understand the willingness of God. We as fathers are willing to give our children what they need. We're not always able. God is able. That's what in heaven means. It means, too, that we don't conform, uh, form every, any conception of his heavenly majesty. We don't create God in our own mind. We don't create God in our own image. Our God also is a consuming fire. He is gracious. He is merciful. He is kind. He is long-suffering. And he is also a consuming fire. We may never forget that. We approach unto a holy and heavenly God who is absolutely exalted in His holiness, who seeks unswervingly His own glory, and whose glory is the end of all things, even our own life. Remembering the purpose of God for his own glory. Many a petition just simply dies on our lips. It withers. But that also teaches us he's able. He's able to give us what we ask. And so in reverence for him and in childlike confidence in him, we pray. What's that childlike confidence? You could probably call it audacious. Isn't that what a child does with the parent? The child who knows that the father or mother loves him or her can ask the most audacious things, and they have no doubt that you will do it. Sometimes you have to say no, but they don't doubt that you are able to do it. I would like this, and I would like that, and I would like this. And that's how the believer goes to God. We, he's become our Father. He'll refuse us much less than we'll refuse our children. The Father loveth us. And the proof of that love is He gave Jesus Christ for us. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank Thee for Thy word. Apply it to our hearts. Hear us always, Father, not because we are worthy, but hear us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Two hundred thirty three. Two hundred thirty three. Let's sing 1, 4, and 6. 1, 4, and 6, 233.
grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be and abide with you forever. Amen. Thank you.